discussing the uh, ways and the next two dates, full operation and complete vitrification, who knows when that will get done. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about groundwater plumes for a minute. Dissolved chromium uh, and uh, it was, was discovered all along the river corridor, so all those hundred areas, and uh, also a strontium 90 in those areas. Nitrate, tritium, technetium, and uranium are groundwater problems in the uh, both 100 and 300 areas. Here's the um, 300 area in 2007. Most of these buildings have now been removed, but one of the buildings, the 324 building, when they started to work on it, they discovered that at the bottom of a hot cell, which was a place where they had worked on extremely radioactive materials, there was a crack in the floor, and there had been leakage of these materials into the soil. So, and I only bring this, I mean, this is just one of a series of things that keep being discovered that make the cleanup process enormously more complicated than it appeared at first. And even at first, it seemed terribly complicated. Here's one of the many maps of the groundwater plume. Uh, obviously originating in the 200 area, but working its way uh, southeast. Uh, you can see that it extends. And by the way, notice how close Richland is. It's, it's right on the border of the, uh, uh, the reservation. And uh, Chuck will be uh, talking about where the, uh, the Columbia Generating Station is located. <laughs> so here's another uh, map of plumes. And the reason for projecting this is just to show you that there's a whole series of overlapping plumes. So in many places, there are two or three or more components to the uh, uh, toxic contamination of the soil. What happens is that the stuff goes down through this Vado zone, which is the zone from the surface of the, of the ground down to the groundwater. So it percolates down through there slowly. Different components of the contamination move at different rates. And obviously, the amount of rainwater determines how much uh, flow there is through this Beto zone. But it gets down to the groundwater level. And important to know that as it works its way into the, uh, toward the river, this zone here doesn't just flow this way. When the river is very high, the flow is in the reverse direction. So it's going back and forth through this, uh, what they, part of it is called a periodically re-wetted zone. So in any case, that's, that's where the uh, groundwater contaminants are moving. That's the, the uh, pathway by which they move toward the river. Okay, now, tanks. We've got 149 tanks in 12 farms. Uh, 67 uh, are currently known or suspected to have leaked, and 50 were known to have leaked in the 50s. So they've been you know, sitting on this terrible problem for a hell of a long time. 28 double shell tanks, all were okay until this past year when leakage was discovered in one of the double shell tanks. The pumpable, when they discovered, when they realized they had a terrible problem with leakage from the single shell tanks, they said, okay, we'll pump out the liquid from the tank. But it's a pumpable liquid because there's a lot of solids in there. The pumpable liquid was just the stuff that they could get out until the stuff became too heavy or viscous. Uh, they describe it as having the consistency, perhaps, of peanut butter. And that stuff, they can't get out of the tanks. But there's still liquid in that. I mean, just as there's oil and peanut butter, there's uh, aqueous liquid in these tanks at present. 
And I think most of you are aware, recently they have revealed that six of the tanks are actively leaking into the uh, environment. Here is a, a picture of a 530-gallon tank. The double-shell tanks uh, are about twice this size. Uh, they range up to 1.2 million gallons. This uh, shows the complexity of the tank farm site. So there's a lot of piping connecting. This is the sea farm, and there are 16 tanks under the ground there. This is the place where they're doing the most active work to try to get the tanks actually empty. 